So I'm going to talk today about the problem of extracting knowledge from text data and images. And I'm going to focus on research that's been going on here uh, at UMBC by our faculty and students. And I'll talk about first the, the set the context for the way I think of the problem, and then talk about uh, some sample of specific research projects that have been done, and finally wind up with uh, some uh, challenges and opportunities for uh, more research. Uh, the part of the context is uh, well, something we all know. We're awash with data today. And one of the reasons why we're awash with data is that the internet, and more specifically the web, have made it very easy to share data and to access and find data. This is something that I think have made us all smarter. Uh, well, maybe in some ways it's made us all dumber. But you know, if you want to know something, uh, we no longer go to the, our Encyclopedia Britannica that our parents bought for us or we bought for our children. But you go to the web, and you get immediate access to uh, information. But um, there are still problems in this, and one of them is that the web and the kind of information that's on the web is designed for human consumption. It's difficult for machines uh, to become smarter by looking at this data. They can. These are research problems. We're trying to get machines to understand natural language and understand videos and text. But um, the content of the web is mostly uh, text, spoken language, images, videos, or certain kinds of simple structured data in the form of tables. These are easy and natural for people to understand. Well, that's, that's why we use them. Um, but it's hard for machines to understand. So what we'd like to do is to give machines, to make them more intelligent, access to knowledge in a form that's natural and easy for them to process and understand. Okay. So what I'll talk about is that the machines leave, uh, need what we call knowledge graphs. Uh, knowledge graph is the new buzzword. We used to talk about knowledge bases. Uh, this is a, these are uh, sources of information that uh, is high quality, uh, semi-structured. So they, they use graphs for the most part as the data structure rather than uh, tables like uh, uh, SQL. Um, information about entities and events and relations and sentiment and, and you know, whatever, whatever you need to represent. Uh, but moreover, they're supported by rich semantic schemas that contain a lot of common sense knowledge. For example, you know that uh, people are kind of animals and you may have specific knowledge that are true for all animals and so they're true for all people and they're true for me because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a person and a person is an animal and therefore you know, I could be either alive or dead, for example. Um, and they're also linked to shared background knowledge. The shared background knowledge could be in a system like Watson, or it could be in a system like uh, Wikipedia, uh, or the Google Knowledge Graph. Um, and finally, uh, the information in a knowledge graph should be easily integrated. Uh, it's hard to integrate two relational tables if they've been developed by different uh, organizations, but having two graph databases uh, it's easier to integrate them, uh, fused and reasoned with, and they should also be represented and accessed by uh, standard APIs. So that's the context we're working with, and what I'll talk about are some uh, examples, a small sampling of a recent exciting research being done by UMBC faculty and students with the general theme of, of analyzing some data, whether it's text or videos or, or some other kind of data, and producing a knowledge graph, which is then easy for some kind of AI system to deal with. And that AI system no longer needs to look at the original pictures, look at the original text, and think long and hard about it to figure out what they might mean. So, well, I guess this is an old version of the slides. Um, I, uh, I had a great slide from Hamid Persiavich. And uh, uh, that was one of the ones I added at the last minute, uh, well, a couple days ago. Um, and but let me describe what he's doing. Hamid Persiavich uh, works on computer vision with neural network uh, learning systems. And his slide 
uh, showed four problems that he's working on with his students now. Let's see if I can remember them. Um, oh, the first one is that the current uh, state of the art, state of the practice maybe in machine learning for computer vision is that I give uh, a system um, thousands or tens of thousands of pictures of animals, and for each picture, I've got the label of what kind of animal it is. Dog, monkey, cat, none of the above. And then the system learns uh, what dogs look like, what cats look like, and uh, what uh, uh, different a animals look like. And I can then give it a new picture that it hasn't seen before, and it can classify it as one of the things it knows how to recognize. The problem with that is you need a lot of training data. Not only that, you need a lot of training data with the right answer. And so it's supervised machine learning. He's looking at the problem of, suppose I give you a large collection of pictures. Some of them are dogs, some of them are cats, some of them are buses, some of them are, are pictures of people playing basketball. And the, mach the machine learns to cluster these uh, based on uh, visual features. And so it's able to come up with clusters of these things, whatever they are, I don't know what they are, I don't know what you call them, but they all look very similar, and they're buses. And these pictures over here, uh, I don't know what they are, but they all look like similar, and they're pictures of dogs. And it makes some occasional mistakes. You might get a picture of a person, person who has unusual hair and kind of you know, looks to a machine like a dog. Uh, a second problem he's dealing with is um, a problem with taking video and being able to predict from a short video sequence, or maybe just even one frame, what might happen next. And the application there is to help hum uh, robots who have to interact with people uh, predict what's going to happen next. So, for example, if you see a picture that looks like a train and it's uh, at a station, what might happen next? It might start moving. If you see a picture, picture of a person holding a basketball, in front of a basket, what might happen next? The ball might be thrown. So his uh, system uh, learns how to do that uh, from examining lots of videos. Um, a third example, well, let's go right to the fourth example, uh, adversarial learning. Um, this is a problem today that's been revealed for a couple of years, and that is that if you train a machine learning system, for example, to recognize different kinds of animals, dog, cat, panda bear, monkey, um, it can do a pretty good job. However, uh, researchers learned that if you have some clever techniques with a machine learning system, you can find some minimal ways to change the picture uh, that to a human eye don't, don't look like it should really change the way the picture looks. You just change half a dozen pixels. And, but to the machine learning system that's been trained, it might look at a picture of a panda bear and say, oh, that's a giraffe. It's, it's kind of surprising. Uh, so uh, Dr. Percy Abich and his students have been looking at that problem, uh, trying to understand various techniques to figure out how to fool machine learning systems, not with the aim of trying to fool these machine learning systems, but to build machine learning systems that can better uh, defend themselves against adversaries who might try to fool them. Uh, for example, by uh, having a picture of a, a terrorist with uh, some odd things on, on their uh, body or that they're carrying that might fool uh, um, you know, a non-robust machine learning system into thinking uh, it's um, you know, something totally unconnected. All right, so the second example uh, here that I have is uh, work that I've been directly involved with on processing, uh, extracting information from text. And it's, uh, I helped develop the system called Kelvin uh, that uh, was developed at the Human Language Technology Center of Excellence that's housed at Johns Hopkins and includes people from Johns Hopkins and UMBC and the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, and this system has, we've used this system to take part in an interesting uh, exercise that uh, NIST runs every year called Text Analysis Conference Knowledge-Based Population Task. The task is challenging. In the last couple of years, it's involved reading documents, a third in English, a third in Chinese, and a third in Spanish, and from them to be able to extract entities and relations and events and other information. And to take that uh, data from each document 
and combine it into a single knowledge graph. And to do that, you need to be able to recognize that, oh, this George Bush in this document is the same as that Bush in that document. And then link those to an external knowledge base when possible. Say, oh yeah, that George Bush, that's George Bush, the 41st president of the United States. And you can do this based on you know, what's in the documents that uh, they, they appeared in. Um, so our system was able to read, uh, uh, the challenge task is, uh, and this will give you uh, 90,000 documents and say, go at it, Don't, can't change your system when, once you've gotten the documents. And a week later, you've got to give them back a knowledge base or knowledge graph, which they evaluate. So 90,000 newswire uh, and social media documents, third English, third Spanish, third Chinese, uh, produced a knowledge graph on our system with 2.2 uh, million facts about 465,000 entities. Uh, so again, uh, and with the task of natural language, I wanted to describe a little some work by Professor Shimei Pan and her student, our Peter Roy. This is work we're doing for cybersecurity uh, in collaboration with uh, IBM. And the task is to do this kind of information extraction for cybersecurity text. Uh, now, one of the techniques that's very popular in uh, data analytics for text these days is word embeddings. And the idea is we can learn, build a system that can learn semantic representations, the meaning of words, in an unsupervised fashion just by seeing what they co-occur with. So if I talk about my pet dog, if I, you talk about your pet cat, I talk about I like uh, cats, they're great pets. The fact that pet and cat and pet and dog uh, occur a lot together, uh, increases the similarity, semantic similarity of cat and dog. Even though they're totally different, we think of them as being kind of semantically similar, put them in the same bucket. Um, so doing this usually requires analyzing a large amount of text. A billion words, for example, would be typical. 10 billion words is even better, because it's statistical data. But we don't have 10 billion words of uh, information about malware. It's harder to come by and it changes real fast, so we need to find ways to to get this information with uh, less text for training. And she's looked at a technique where we can take some structured data, semi-structured data, some knowledge graph data that we already have, and embed it in the text in a way that these algorithms can then work on a combination of the text statistics and also a little bit of knowledge graph information. And she's shown that this performs uh, much better than the standard uh, word embedding techniques. Uh, let me mention also some language work by Dr. Frank Ferraro. Uh, uh, he's looking at the problem of how you understand events uh, in text. Uh, so we might have an, uh, what we call an event template or frame like the attack template on the right. Uh, and if we have that, it makes it easier to interpret the text on the left, three people have been fatally shot and so forth, and to figure out what are the key elements in a representation of what happened. So the scientific question he's dealing with is, how do we learn what these templates are just by analyzing lots of texts, say all the text in Wikipedia? And then an engineering question is, once we've got some of those templates, a good collection of those templates, how do we use them to take new text and to help recognize events or other complicated relations? It's a problem that involves both natural language processing, linguistic data, and a lot of machine learning. Um, uh, a final example, I'll stop after this one, is work by uh, Dr. Jennifer, Jennifer Sleeman in her recent PhD thesis. Uh, she worked with uh, Dr. Milt Halem and, and also me in working this. But Dr. Halem gave her a very interesting problem, which is read the text from the IPCC reports on climate change, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Every five years, they produce a massive report, many volumes, many chapters, and those reports cite tens of thousands of external research documents. She's analyzed this data to discover concepts in there, and then to show which concepts are rising and falling in importance, and importantly, to be able to predict, based on this year's report, um, what's gonna be rising or falling in next year's report. Uh, and she did this by uh, a technique she, she invented called cross-domain dynamic topic modeling. Uh, very exciting work. It, doesn't, it works not only for climate change, but it would work for any scientific discipline, probably, and maybe for other disciplines as well. So uh, I'll stop there, um, and uh, I won't talk about our system to, to uh, recommend rap music uh, based on the current rap music you like, but uh, if you're interested, if you like rap music, uh, 
You can try our system and you know, I'll tell you more about it. Um, and just finish up with these uh, challenges. Well, the challenges really, we see them as opportunities as researchers, and not as problems, but as gifts, things we can work on. And I, I thought of three off the top of my head. The first is we want to develop systems that combine machine learning and other forms of reasoning. Because we know that people bring lots of reasoning strategies to bear in a problem. Logic reasoning as well as uh, kind of statistical reasoning. The second challenge is an opportunity is to develop systems, AI systems that we can uh, understand and trust. We don't want to be in a situation where uh, we can't say, oh yeah, uh, why, why do you recommend that, you know, this action? Or why, do you, why do you, did you make this uh, interpretation? Um, so we want to develop AI systems that are robust, explainable, and accurate, and have been trained on unbiased data. And a third uh, challenge or opportunity is to develop systems that continually improve through what we call lifelong learning. And uh, we don't want to build systems that require a team of uh, AI engineers to retrain every three years to keep them going. We'd like to develop systems that uh, as they're presented with new data and maybe get some feedback on it, uh, they'll retrain themselves and uh, gradually improve just as people are able to do. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, uh, you know, I'm happy to talk more about this uh, after the talk or send me an email and I'll put you in touch with uh, the, the right researchers. Thank you.